strategic linguistic table and vice versa. Um, I think that's going to be uh, an, an interesting talk. But before we start, some practical uh, points. So please, if you're not presenting, turn off your video and audio. I, I think everybody has done that uh, now. So then we have the full bandwidth for the uh, for the presenter, for Karin. And it also reduces the, the background noise. So we can actually hear what's, what's being said. If you have any questions, also during the presentation, you could just uh, type them in the chat and then we can go through them uh, after the presentation. Uh, all of these uh, presentations, all the colloquia are recorded uh, and also made available on the Sadilar website. So you can find a link there. Uh, on the Sadilar website, you can find all these recordings so you can look back uh, at previous uh, uh, colloquia as well. Um, so something else, this colloquium is part of the Escalator project. Uh, you can find a link uh, there on the slide as well. So part of the Sadilar uh, website. The Escalator project is um, a project that tries to boost the uh, digital humanities in South Africa. So it contains a membership program, uh, sorry, a mentorship program where you can learn more about uh, digital humanities on, on different levels. Several of these mentorship programs uh, tracks are currently running. You can also find information on a Slack, and the Slack is a system where you can essentially chat um, with other people uh, that are member of the Slack, and you can ask questions on digital humanities, on different techniques, um, etc. So you might want to join uh, the Slack channel as well. You can find information on how to do that also on the uh, Escalator website. Okay, so now it's time to uh, to start the uh, the presentation. So I'm very happy to have uh, Karine van der Berg here. She is a senior lecturer in English at the uh, NWU, and her general area of interest is applied linguistics. Her research training is in the measurement of English as a second language for pedagogical purposes, so language testing, where validation is a major concern. More recently, she's become uh, interested in describing and measure, measuring language features in order to address language related problems in the legal context. Her broad research focus pertains to the use of traditional methods and digital tools to describe and analyze language use in context. She is particularly interested in applying these methods and tools for authorship comparison and author intention. So I'm very, very much looking forward to this presentation. Uh, I'll stop my share so that Karin can share her screen and um, Karin, the floor is, the di digital floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Menu. And again, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> so I have to start with a disclaimer. Um, I deviate from my original um, developmental breakdown in the abstract. Um, following a brief introduction to forensic linguistics, I contextualize authorship verification in relation to the regulation of expert witnesses in court. This serves to emphasize the need for valid linguistic measurement to meet stringent scientific requirement. It also motivates my interest in digital humanities as I am in search of tools and resources to explore language use from different perspectives and in ways that are perhaps more efficient than traditional um, methods. Gathering various forms of evidence and presenting it in the form of an argument in the sense proposed by Michael T. Kane serves to strengthen linguistic measurement and the interpretation that linguists make about authorship based on those measurements. My conception of DH and its relation to forensic linguistics is subsumed under the assumptions from which I depart for the present investigation. I discuss these assumptions to situate the case study which I present in detail today. I also refer the audience to additional resources for further reading rather than attempting to summarize these. Finally, I address some concerns by outlining challenges of authorship verif verification, but also in relation to the digital transformation of linguistic analysis. Following Coulthard and Johnson, forensic linguistics in the broad sense concerns three main areas. 
the written language of the law. Sorry, let me just move the thing a little bit. The written language of the law spoken into action in legal context, language as evidence. More narrowly, um, the definition restricts the discipline to language as evidence alone. For my purpose today, I am mainly concerned with forensic linguistics in this narrow sense. <clears throat> For the purpose of this presentation, the task is one of authorship attribution. The question is whether author X wrote the text in question or not. So it's closed authorship inquiry. As far as authorship attribution goes, it is one of the more straightforward challenges. However, based on the outcome of a case, the decision regarding authorship may have far reaching consequences, such as jail time. Scientific rigor and valid measurement is therefore essential for the linguist who is involved in legal inquiry and tasked with presenting evidence on account of language in use. Such evidence may inform legal decisions that impact the lives of various parties. <clears throat> the nature of authorship verification as a task is ad hoc. Even with a single genre, textual features that work well to differentiate author A from a set of peers might fail to separate author B from the same set of peers. Due to the many idiosyncrasies that occur in an individual's writing style, this makes it challenging to develop systems that can be robustly scaled across many different individuals. Modeling authorial writing style requires bespoke models that are tailored to the characteristics of a single author or a specific set of authors. And this is according to Kestermont et al. in 2021. As such, there is no standard forensic linguistic method or even a golden um, standard for authorship verification. There are various approaches to authorship uh, verification and the one that I am uh, that I am employing here today um, or demonstrating is, um, is a combination of stylistic and stylometric um, analyses. Meanwhile, while there's no standard um, method, criminals continue to, to defame, threaten, blackmail, steal, and illicit hate. In such instances, legal practitioners sometimes request assistance from linguists to investigate language as evidence. Forensic linguists therefore can play a supporting role in legal investigations by providing additional insight and perspectives based on linguistic analysis to be considered for, um, for the purpose of forensic evidence. However, the admission of expert witnesses and evidence in court is becoming more stringently regulated. Courts will not simply allow evidence because the person testifying is an expert in the field. Locally, in Helen Suzman Foundation versus President of the Republic of South Africa, the Constitutional Court held that expert witness or opinion evidence is only admissible if the evidence is in a better position than the court to give an opinion. This is according to Kruger 2020. The court requires more than saying to be considered so. Various principles help to determine whether expert evidence is admissible in a particular case. In Hall Townsend versus Ruet, the court formulated the following principles um, summarized on screen in this regard. I would like to emphasize the fourth requirement. The fact upon which the expert opinion is based must be proved by admissible evidence and must not be based on hypothetical scenarios. This requirement is central to my discussion today as one of the main concerns for forensic linguistic task with authorship comparison is to demonstrate the scientific rigor, reliability and validity of the methodology employed to render the, re the results. Moreover, the inferences made based on those results should be transparent, accurate, valid. Humanities methodologies often lack the scientific rigor afforded by natural scientific experimentation and measurement, yet the need to argue for valid linguistic measurement is more pressing than ever. Standardized language tests serve a gatekeeping function. They inform high sex decisions such as who may enter a country, who is admitted for further education, or who is a better candidate to fill a position in a corporate company. Similarly, 
As a subfield of applied linguistics, forensic linguistics entails the application of knowledge about language, language development, and language use to address practical language related problems, to inform legal inquiry, but also to ensure just and fair legislation. As I have indicated, I'm concerned today with the narrow sense of forensic linguistics. Um, more particularly, I'm concerned with the applied linguist, uh, with how the applied linguist can present forensic evidence that is sound, fair, and based on the valid measurement of idiolectal idiosyncrasies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a discussion toward valid linguistic measurement. I consider what digital humanities can bring to the proverbial, tra proverbial table for forensic linguistics and how linguistic interpretation can bring DH methods to life. <clears throat> I approach this discussion as an applied linguist, not as an expert in digital humanities. Specifically, aiming to share my initial steps in the exploration of the potential value that digital humanities as a methodology may offer forensic linguistics as a field of inquiry. I depart from the following main assumptions. Forensic linguistics is linguistically orientated, but is closely related to law and legal practice. This means that linguistic theory, description and methodologies inform the forensic linguistic inquiry although such inquiry is conducted for legal purposes. Like digital humanities, forensic linguistics is essentially interdisciplinary. As such, cross-disciplinary collaboration is essential to address complex legal questions, such as who wrote this. Unlike digital humanities, forensic linguistics is a field of inquiry. From my perspective, DH is a methodological commons. Digital humanities scholars Henry Short and Willard McCarty illustrate the notion of a methodological commons as presented in the figure on the screen. <clears throat> I find the following uh, brief description by digital humanist scholar David Gibbon useful to anchor my interpretation of the DH discussion today. If I have time, I will return to it um, and read through it more carefully. To continue in terms of points of departure, authorship attribution is a text-based task. Texts may include letters, notes, diaries, blog posts, tweets, speeches, telephone calls, and more. Spoken and written texts may be of interest, and in both cases, texts may either be digital or in print. Author verification is never a simple task. There is no one size fits all solution, as yet at least, to investigate questions of authorship. Even within a single genre, textual features that work well to differentiate author A from a set of peers might fail to separate author B from the same set of peers. The notion of an idiolect informs authorship verification tasks. Kestemont et al. says that much of the research in present day computational authorship identification is implicitly underpinned by a basic assumption that could be summarized as the Stylome hypothesis. The Stylome hypothesis, according to Kestemont et al., is an attractive working hypothesis, but it remains hard to demonstrate, let alone prove. However, the FBI profiler and linguist James Fitzgerald successfully demonstrated the power of linguistic co-selection to help identify the so-called Unabomber. Between 1978 and 1995, an American male posted a series of bombs targeting mainly universities and airlines. In 1995, six national media publications received a manuscript of 35,000 words entitled Industrial Society and Its Future, allegedly from the Unabomber. In addition, the alleged bomber offered to stop sending bombs if the manuscript were published. 
three months after the publica pub publication of the manifesto in the Washington Post, a man contacted the FBI saying the manifesto sounded as if it had been written by his brother. The man particularly recognized the phrase cool-headed logician as evidently familiar, an ideological preference of sorts. The FBI tracked down the brother who had been living in a remote hut and arrested him. On site, they found very various documents, including a 300-word newspaper article on the same topic as the manifesto. The suspect had written it a decade earlier. The comparison rendered major similarities between the manifesto and the newspaper article in the form of a series of lexical and grammatical words and fixed phrases. This was considered sufficient evidence of common authorship. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Coulthard and Johnson described the argument and counter-argument presented in regards to the linguistic evidence as follows. The defense contracted a linguist, Robin Lakoff, who counter-argued that one could attach no significance to the fact that both documents shared these items on the grounds that anyone can use any word at any time and that consequently shared vocabulary can have no diagnostic significance. Lakoff singled out 12 words and phrases for the particular criticism on the grounds that they were items that could be expected to occur in any text that, like these two, was arguing a case. At any rate, clearly gotten in practice, moreover, more or less. On the other hand, presumably, propaganda, thereabouts, and the words derived from the roots argu and propos. In response, the FBI searched the internet which in those days was a fraction of the signs it is today. But even so, they discovered some 3 million documents which contained one or more of the 12 items. However, when they narrowed the search to only documents which included instances of all 12 items, they found a mere 69. On closer inspection, every single one proved to be an internet version of the 35,000 word manifesto. This was a massive rejection of the defensive experts view of text creation as purely open choice. So I depart from the assumption that authorship verification is best informed by linguistic theory that accounts for intra-author variation while recognizing idiosyncratic preference evident in individual language use. These preferences may be systematic yet linguistically marked. The duty of the forensic linguist in forensic investigation is to see what might not be evident to the naked eye. Since language use is complex, I depart from the assumption that a multi-pronged approach to authorship of verification, drawing on various forms of linguistic evidence, is necessary to inform a linguistic argument and support valid linguistic measure. These forms of evidence can be collected by means of various instruments. The linguistic toolbox offers tools such as discourse analysis, corpus analysis, close reading, stylistic description, and style measurement. These tools are used to explore, analyze, and describe bits of language evidence across linguistic levels. <clears throat> I further assume that digital humanities offers a methodological commons that has the potential of expanding the forensic linguistic toolbox of amplifying linguistic exploration, description, and analysis. By using digital tools and resources, the linguist can see what might not be evident to the naked eye. Again, a case in point is Fitzgerald's use of the World Wide Web to demonstrate tendencies for linguistic co-selection. Evidently, the World Wide Web itself is a product of a cross-disciplinary research endeavor named, namely the European Council for Nuclear Research, or CERN. CERN has become one of the longest and most successful collaborations in the history of science. Um, in addition to the world's highest energy particle accelerator, one of the products um, from CERN is the World Wide Web itself. Created by Sir Tim Lee, 
Tim Berners-Lee for the purpose of collaborating with peers while working at CERN. Finally, the use of various tools can increase reliability and validity of authorship verification methods. Some of these tools may be useful to explore or even measure similar similarities and or differences in terms of authorship markers from new perspectives. Insight from such perspectives inform a linguistic argument and enables the linguist to present forensic evidence that meets stringent requirements of admissibility. <clears throat> Much in the same way, high stakes language test developers collect various forms of evidence to support claims that a test measures what it purports to measure. It is not the instrument itself that's valid per se, but rather the interpretations that we make based on the measurement using the instrument. In other words, validity is understood to be an indication of whether appropriate interpretations are based on the assessment. <clears throat> This means that various methodologies are employed in combination to collect data, justifying the use of these instruments to elicit relevant information about authentic language use and language proficiency. I depart from the assumption that valid linguistic measurement can be achieved in the same way in the forensic linguistic context. <clears throat> linguistic attributes need to be described and measured using relevant tools and resources to gain information about an author. However, because the implications are high stakes, we heed skepticism and warning, warnings such as those presented by Gibbons and take care not to assume more than what the data shows. I see validity as the most fundamental quality of measurement in the forensic linguistic context. I will now share with you my exploration towards validating the use of a combined methodological approach to authorship verification as proposed by Kutsia. I have found some digital tools useful to complement the core linguistic description and analysis based on stylistic and stylometric um, and corpus analytic methods. <clears throat> The facts of the case resemble that of State versus Kerhoho, in which um, Kutsia was uh, involved. The accused is charged with defamation on account of various publications posted mainly in blog format on the internet. The commission, the commission authorship comparison is only one component in a much broader um, investigation. The data comprises the following sets. The admit set, which is used as the baseline data set. Um, it contains a series of emails um, authored by the accused. The denied set, which is the main contested set, um, and it contains a series of blog inscriptions suspected to have been produced by the accused. In addition, three subsets of text written in similar vein and on similar topics. Um, but in the form of some formal and some less formal uh, newspaper articles. Um, I just want to briefly um, summarize the, the data sets um, in comparison to those um, that were studied in Kotsia or by Kotsia uh, for the Father Punch case, just to give you a sense of the size of the data sets um, that I worked with. And you will note that subset three um, contains some texts that were very short. So for the most part, um, we had ample text to work with, um, but apart from the various authored texts, which are um, included in subset three. For the analysis, um, I stated the following hypothesis. Um, and as point of departure, I aim to explore whether the null hypothesis could easily be accepted. If not, this would suggest that, um, that H1 is more plausible. Okay, so for the stylometric analysis, I employed, I employed um, wordsmith tools. Um, 
this is computer software that is really readily used by linguists to conduct linguistic analyses. Um, and I employed the word list, keyword, and concordance functions. <clears throat> The findings overall suggest that it is highly unlikely that the different authors that different authors compose the documentation. Um, the grey columns in the grey columns presented here are what is most important. With one degree of freedom, any result higher than 3.84 is statistically significant. Some variance is to be expected, and with reference to comparative research, a range of keenness values up to 15 was considered acceptable. Keenness values of more than 15 would, su would suggest too much variation um, and indicate uh, different authors. The stylometric results um, overall show um, that there is great similarity between the admitted set and the denied set. Therefore, the cytometric results suggest refuting the null hypothesis. In addition, it provides strong evidence that subset one was authored by the same person who compiled the admit set or the accused. Um, it also provides fair to strong evidence that subset two was also compiled by this person um and less certain um it's a fair evidence that subset three was also authored <clears throat> in order to illuminate and cross-check the stylometric results i also analyzed the data sets using the digital software package called stylo which runs in our studio this i consider a digital tool the results not only support the stylometric results reported before, but it helps to put the numerical results into perspective. From the graphic, it is quite evident that the baseline data set um, and the main data set cluster together, whereas the three various author texts um, cluster on a separate track. So those are the those are the shorter texts, um, and they the stylometric analysis suggested uh, greater variance, greater difference between those texts. Um, and this may be indicative of um, influences of external factors, such as um, language editing that took place. <clears throat> well, the stylistic analysis, <clears throat> the stylistic analysis served to corroborate the stylometric analysis, investigate the extent to which I could corroborate the findings. Um, and for this, I implemented the digital software tool called Atlas TI. The software is quite readily used by linguists and applied linguists who conduct qualitative analysis. However, I found that the digital nature of this tool not only helps to approach the stylistic annotation more consistently, it is, for example, easy to add or change categories as the analysis progresses, but it helps to make it more systematic and dynamic. I particularly appreciated the fact that various forms of digital text can be uploaded. This, mean, this meant that I could work directly on the scanned versions of the documents as I received them in PDF format. In this way, the original message remains along with any typographical features that may or may not prove to be important. The screenshot shows the original document format. And as you can see, there are various layers of annotation on the right hand side of the screen. The software also offers an option to make a word cloud, which is quite easy to do. Um, and there are there is also an intercoder um, mode which allows different coders to code the same document and assign the same label to the same quotation this is a smart feature to use um, when you want to improve coder inter or intra rater uh, coder inter and intra um, reliability since the same text can be coded with the same um, code more than once 
<clears throat> the software also facilitates the analysis of the data in the sense that the researcher can generate reports based on the occurrence or co-occurrence of features. These reports can be generated in network format as shown on the screen, um, as a code tree, as lists of quotations and many other um, formats. In this view, the researcher can analyze the annotation, the selected uh, annotations by indicating relationships such as contradicts, is a, is a property of, or is associated with. I found this digital tool much more effective for an in-depth stylistic analysis than your run-of-the-mill colored coded highlighting and collection of sticky notes onto pieces of paper. As with Stylo, visual reports such as these help to make results more accessible for non-technical audiences. By implication, the evidence becomes more meaningful to the non-expert and more useful towards supporting the investigation. I specifically used Atlas TI to facilitate a systematic deductive analysis of the uncontested documents, followed by an inductive description and comparison of the contested samples. In addition, I used the UCRAL log likelihood and effect size calculator to investigate whether statistically significant differences were evident between the most prominent stylistic features identified during the error analysis and stylistic analysis. Again, the latter is a linguistic tool that is um, often employed by, um, by corpus linguists. <clears throat> the findings of the stylistics, uh, stylistics analysis suggests that uh, the language used across samples is complex, the style is generally formal to very formal, regardless of the genre, considering that the sets included letters to prosecuting legal firms in comparison to informal blog posts. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the language used was very formal. The author appears to be well-educated and highly proficient in English. That said, there were various instances across the data sets that displayed similar errors. Prominent errors included incorrect use of tense and aspect but also related to sentence complexity and syntactic punctuation preferences. In such cases, cases I employed the UCRAL calculator um, to establish statistical significance. Despite being capable of using complex language in a formal register, which resembles that of legal jargon, the errors evident across the subsets are characteristic of second language speakers of English. In addition, syntactic choices are made more unconsciously, and it is more difficult, even impossible, to imitate such choices consistently and deliberately. On screen, I summarize the 10 most prominent stylistic features. They are grouped into three general categories. Some of the categories do overlap, but in each case, there is a distinct focus, which would categorize a salient feature into one of the three main groups. Here we have syntax, and you can see that it's divided into sub, uh, subsections with um, examples. Here is an example of the application of the overall calculator to investigate whether there were statistically significant differences between the use of clausal subordination with reference to relational clauses with which comma, as well as and that. The log likelihood indicates whether there is a significant difference, and the effect size indicates the magnitude of the difference, if any. Results show no significant difference, nor a great effect size. This suggests that the use of these um, linguistic elements do not differ significantly um, across the sets. The next main category relates to the use of punctuation as means of expression, for example, to show anger and orthographical features. These features may be easier to imitate, but again, I emphasize that no single aspect should be considered in isolation. The point is that there are layers of evidence across linguistic levels of meaning making. In addition to these surface features, 
the omission of syntactic punctuation was quite prominent and relates to clausal subordination, which was included in the previous category. The last category includes evidence that relate to lexical preference, spelling preferences, and idiomatic expression. There were no spelling errors as such, but there is a preference for American spelling. It was interesting to note the occurrence of a harpex legomenon as a pose spelled A-P-P-O-S-E across the suspected samples. It occurs, it occurs only once per sample. The verb oppose means to place next to something, to place side by side. In comparison, the adjective oppose, O-P-P-O-S-E, means to contrast. In considering the context of the use in each sample, it is evident that as opposed to is applied incorrectly to carry the meaning of contrast. Idiomatic expressions further include numerous examples of binominals such as null and void, prominent variation of the description, malicious, false and misleading to describe information being distributed about the plaintiff. Overall, the stylistic analysis um, offers ample evidence to support shared authorship to corroborate the stylometric analysis. Based on the analysis, therefore, um, HO is refuted and H1 is supported. So what can we say about the approach in terms of validity? I concur with Kutsia, who argues that a combined stylistic and stylometric approach contributes to the principle of scientific rigor that underlies the credibility and acceptance of expert evidence presented by linguists in court. This method allows for demonstrating statistical significance in a transparent way. Like Kutsia, I believe that the application of the combined approach to a wider range of text types should lead to an increasing refinement of this methodology in future. In this regard, the evidence gathered from various sources makes for a substantiated argument for validity in the sense proposed by Michael T. Kane, a validity argument, a linguistic argument for validation. Validation is, however, a continuous process, cyclical um, in nature. I have aimed to demonstrate here how the use of digital tools such as Stylo and Atlas TI can enrich and facilitate authorship verification methodology and contribute to the validation of these methods. This brings me to the final consideration in terms of what digital humanities can bring to the table for forensic linguistics and vice versa. I am a novice as far as DH is concerned, but my initial attempts at exploring possibilities offered by DH methodologies is promising. It is evident that digital tools and resources can facilitate linguistic analyses and help to make technical evidence more accessible for non-technical audiences. In addition, it can serve to strengthen an argument for the validity of linguistic measurement for the purpose of author verification to be presented in court. At the same time, linguistic theory, methodology and tools may serve other areas of inquiry equally well. I hope I have managed to demonstrate the interface between linguistics, law and digital humanities in my talk, at least to some extent. Um, but in case you're interested in reading more, um, I, I list a number of um, recent publications for the most part um, on the topic. So Kestamont et al. Um, present an overview of cross-domain authorship verification tasks. Longy addresses the use of digital humanities and linguistics to help with terrorism investigations. Very interesting read. Um, Huniyadi, Arabi, and Tos consider the contribution of forensic linguistic to humanities computing. And finally, um, Zamesnik and Laskova proposes a methodological, a methodological basis for building digital humanities education on a linguistic background. <clears throat> However, as a novice, we sometimes find ourselves um, down the rabbit hole very quickly. Um, and therefore, I would like to highlight that 
my focus today, the scope of my focus was very limited. Um, as I indicated, um, authorship verification um, closed, uh, it was a closed inquiry, so the question was whether someone had written um, the text or not, um, and specifically my choice of methodology was that of a combination of stylistic and stylometric um, analysis. I'd like to conclude uh, with a few remarks. Um, validity is the most fundamental quality of measurement um, instruments in the forensic linguistic context. As such, the linguist needs to make sure that we are able to argue um, and present a case for valid measurement when we present evidence on authorship verification. That said, remember that one size does not fit all. Contextual considerations that need to be taken into account um, include text length, genre, multiple authorship, multilingual authors, etc. Therefore, the need for interdisciplinary exploration um, between DH special, specialists, linguists, and lawyers um, is essential. <clears throat> These are some of the challenges that we face. Um, and at this point, I would like to invite members of the audience uh, today or, um, or beyond this presentation um, to, uh, to make suggestions in terms of um, tools that may be available that, that, that could be useful uh, for the purpose of authorship verification um, and to contribute to the rigorous measurement of linguistic um, attributes in order in order to um, explore authorship verification. I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, there is some time for questions, uh, and I see that John John Stein has already written something. So, if other people have questions, please just type them in the chat, and then we can we can take it from there. Uh, so John says, also dabbled with the use of stylo and R in the past, an aspect that I wonder about is what the impact of writing support tools, such, such as Grammarly and things such as auto spelling checkers, etc., would be in terms of lessening the visibility of a unique author fingerprint in texts. An area that I think may yield additional results uh, is going deeper by looking at metadata behind the document when as available as well as uh, closer reading approaches to highlight overlapping topics and themes. Mm. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Joan. And definitely you're quite, um, you're quite right. Um, tools such as Grammarly um, obscure um, many of, of um, the attributes that are idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic, especially when we're looking at things like um, like errors, syntactical punctuation, um, spelling errors. However, um, in this investigation, um, I noted that there were no real spelling errors as such. Um, or, or, so I think yes, but it depends. Um, for me, the most important thing is to consider collective evidence. So even if we do find that um, students, for example, uses Grammarly to improve their, their grammar and, and, so, and, and so on and so forth, um, there may be other idiosyncratic features that, um, that are visible. That said, um, genre um, requirements, um, and, and, and structures and things like that um, also obscure um, idiolectal um, idiosyncrasies um, more prominently. So if we are comparing academic writing, for example, it becomes quite difficult um, because there are so many different influences, so many rules and things that, that tend to cover it up. So that's why I said uh, right at the beginning of the talk that this is a pretty straightforward authorship question and so it happens that that 
even though there weren't that many errors, the errors that were evident, the grammatical errors that were evident, um, rendered quite substantial evidence um, of, of um, author idiolect. Cool, thanks. So Tanya uh, also asked a question here, kind of related to that, I think, how big is the impact of language editing in texts? Is that something that's being actively investigated as well? Um, Tanya, yes, to some extent. Um, I think many, many researchers, um, including myself at this point at least, um, is still hesitant because, because we, we're still struggling to find ways of comparing authors, come just, you know, just dealing with the bottom line question. So um, advanced challenges like these um, tend to take a back seat, but they definitely are, um, they definitely are um, attempts to, um, to study this. Um, one, one topic that's becoming more evident or that I've noticed more readily at least is, for example, authors who go, who try to go out of their way to hide their idiolect. Um, you know, so consciously trying not to sound like themselves, uh, you know, and how to deal with that. So many challenges. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, perhaps I can quickly ask a follow-up question. Um, okay, I see T Tanya still says it might help to use text where you know that there hasn't been a lot of editing yes. involved. Yes. So that's my. Yeah, so we, we try and we try and do that, and um, uh, one of the cornerstone experiments um, conducted by Carol Shasky in America um, entailed her selecting. Um, I think 10 or 14 female students of fairly homogenous backgrounds and that sort of thing, um, and having them write essays um, unedited and using those, those texts as, um, as her ground level data base on which she, um, she tested her hypotheses. Um, I think I think it's very useful, but I still think um, if we if we are able to get raw real ticks, um, such as the ones that 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 I managed to get a hold of for this particular um, experiment with this particular investigation, um, I you know I think that that is more valuable. Um, I can't say for sure that the ticks weren't edited at all. Um, but the fact that there were definite idiosyncratic patterns um, visible across um, across the sets um, tells me that uh, there were there wasn't an external hand in most of the texts. Um, the few shorter texts, um, it, well, they were shorter to start off with, but also the idiosyncratic features were were not as prominent or were not present at all so um you know it, it was it was evident that those texts were likely to have been edited more heavily than the others that that i had to work with okay cool um i, I do see alan uh, has a question so I, I quickly want want to to kind of jump in between Right. Um, so I know there's also some research on the kind of the reverse thing, so authorship obfuscation, yep. where, because it you I, th I think you kind of skipped over that, but having yep. systems that allow people to identify who wrote something has some some privacy issues uh, yes. as well. So yeah, that's kind of related to the uh, to the editing. Yes, yes, it is, um, and definitely there is there is work being done. There, there hasn't, there's not a lot, um, but people are starting to to fiddle around with with that sort of data. It is, um, I think, it, it it makes for a few headaches, um, mm -hmm. but it is very exciting <laughs> um, at the same time. And of course, you know, it um, it's also relevant for. For example, investigations into cyberbullying, you know, and trying to identify yeah. um, authors in in an open set um, of potential authors. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
No, definitely. Okay, so Ellen also has an interesting question. So does the South African legal system generally accept the science of forensic linguistics and respect it uh, as it would something like DNA evidence? Yeah, thank you, Alan, for that question. Um, yes and no. Um, the the requirements um, for expert um, evidence that I presented are for the South African courts, right? So that is that is for our uh, for our um, court system. But in terms of linguistic um, expertise, um, specifically. Um, to some extent, yes. I think mainly um, legal practitioners are still unaware um, of the possible um, supporting role that linguists could play in investigations. And to some extent, you know, some legal practitioners feel that they know enough about language and the law and, and so on and so forth. So why would they need a linguist to explain language use? Um, you know, so I, I think it has more to do with uh, the lack of awareness. Um, in South Africa, the community of uh, people of researchers who, who deal in forensic linguistics um, is quite small. Um, but even in consideration, quite a number of those uh, linguists have actually as um, expert witnesses in court. Um, in terms of the DNA evidence, um, it might be um, it might be interesting to note that even DNA evidence um, is no longer um, accepted as enough in itself because of methodological um, slip ups, um, misinterpretation of data and that sort of thing. So, even though DNA evidence is sort of the golden standard, um, it's no longer considered enough just to just to submit uh, DNA evidence for forensic purposes. Okay, cool. Thanks. I, I actually didn't know that. <laughs> um, let me see. Shamila has a question. Uh, I would guess that threatening communication nowadays is distributed by electronic means that adds another dimension to the tracking process. The linguistic contribution plays a supplementary role in detection. Yes, 100%. So um, definitely linguistic contribution does play a supplementary role. Um, and usually it's it's part of a, a grander investigation and especially um, with electronic uh, digital communication. Um, the challenge, the question is much bigger than just linguistic. Um, yet the linguist can add um, can add interesting, useful um, insight um, to help to help solve a problem like that. Okay, wonderful. Right. I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment. We still have about three minutes to go. I mean, I still have a lot of questions, but I think we need to take that offline at some point <laughs> yeah i um i realized that you know i i i said a lot and i i had to skip over a lot as well um so if anything is unclear or if anyone um wonders about anything please don't hesitate to contact me also um if you would like the reference list um you're welcome to let me know and and i'll be happy to send it to you by email um yeah so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I would, I would really like to invite people to um, correspond with me um, on any aspects that might be of interest to them, and and I'll gladly engage uh, to the best of my abilities. Okay, thank you so much. I, I think if I don't see any, don't see any additional questions, I think we can then leave it here, and I'm sure that we'll um, catch up again, and we can discuss some more of the. Uh, more methodological questions that I had. <laughs> uh, but thank you again so much for the presentation. I thought it was very, very interesting. Uh, we you. had a nice full house here as well. Interesting questions. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the, uh, the whole presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, then we'll stop the recording here and we can close the room. Uh, but thank you so much for the presentation.
Yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. And thank you to everyone uh, who participated today, who attended the, um, the session. Um, 